the portion of the Chukosai was the last, was the closing parsha in Sefer Vayikro. And it concludes, Ela mitzvos, Ela toros, va mitzvos, va chukim, which Hashem gave them at Sinai. And then this portion begins, Vaydabr Shal Moshe, Benidbar Sinai, Bol Moid. Hashem spoke to Moshe in the Sinai desert in the Old Moed. Zerubal so Turim explains that the Torah is juxtaposing Ela Toros Fa Mitzvos Achukim to the Midbar. The Gemara tells us in the Dorim, based on another puzzle, it says, Moshe Rabbeinu says to Klaus, Mi Midbar Matono. That the Torah says that the Torah itself is a gift, but one is able to process it if it has relevance to the Midbar, to the desert. What does that mean? So Mark tells us, it becomes a gift. That if a person negates himself as a desert, a desert has no identity in its own right. It's just a vast area of what? Of desolation. It has no identity. So if a person approaches Torah as he's, if he's a desert, meaning he's available to interact and to teach anyone Torah, then he has a capacity, he's a recipient, he's qualified to be a recipient of Torah. Then he merits the divine assistance that one needs to be able to, to be the repository or to be the processing center for the Torah itself. But the characteristic you have to assume is midbar. Also, as atzmo hefker midbar, as the midbar is hefker, it's ownerless. You have, when it comes to Torah, you have to be available as if your your time is not yours, but your time is is committed to others to teach them Torah. That's that's the Gemara in the Dorim. So the, while the Torah is saying something similar, the juxtaposition of the closing pasuk in Vayikra and the opening pasuk in Bamidbar. We're juxtaposing the Torah to the Midbar to communicate this characteristic that if one behaves Kemidbar, he's Kafka Kemidbar, his life itself is totally dedicated to the Torah itself, but he has no interest in accommodating only his own interests, then he has a capacity to process Torah. That's the Balaturim. So over here, there's, the Orachim HaKadosh points out something interesting. It says, Hashem spoke to Moshe, bin Midbar Sinai Bol Moed. So we speak about the location. What is the location? Midbar Sinai. Vast area. Uh, where in that vast area did he speak to Hashem, to Moshe? Bol Moed, in the communion tent. So we're identifying the large area, and the specific location is Ol Moed. Be'echod la'chodesh, Hasheni, the first of the second month, Bishana Hashenis. The first of the second month, which is Eeyore, and the second year in the desert, let's say some Mitzrayim, when they after they left Egypt. I mean, if you want to continue in the same approach, that we're going from the vast to the specific, what the Torah should have continued when we speak about time, it should have said, Bishana Hashenis, in the second year, on the first day of the second month, as we're going from the Midbar Sinai, the larger to the more specific, the second year, and what day on the second year? The first day of the second month. But yet, no, when the Torah speaks about location, it speaks about the vast location that's specifying the specific location. We speak about time, we speak about first the, the specific time, the first of the second month, then we speak about the larger period, which is the second the second year. Why? Why does it alter going from the more vast, the larger to the more specific, and from the more specific, the specific to the larger? That's the Rechaim HaKadosh's point, what he points out. So he says something interesting. What is the Ol Moed? The Ol Moed is the place, the location of the Shekhinah. As vast as this world is, compared to the Ol Moed, it means nothing. Because everything emanates from the Ol Moed, right? That's the Shekhinah. You know, the Gemara tells us in uh, Shabbos 
that the base of Migdush was called Evan Hashsia. Evan Hashsia. What does Evan Hashsia mean? It was called the sustaining stone. Of course, all the energies that, that emanate from God emanates from the Beis Hamikdash, from the location of the Shechina in this world, and all bracha emanates from there. It shows us. It nourishes and sustains the world. Everything begins in the Beis Hamikdash or in the Mishkan because that's the location of the Shechina. So, come what we speak about. You have the vastness of the desert, but compared to Ol Moed, it's meaningless. So we speak about vastness versus all Moed, the, the Midbar is not vast. So we're going from the, specific, from the specific to the broader. Midbar Sinai is, 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 is infinitesimal compared to the all Moed. And we continue in the same order. We're going from the specific to the more vast. So the reason why the Torah writes in this manner is exactly to magnify this point that when we speak about vastness, it has nothing to do with it. Even though the way we perceive and we evaluate it, something which is unending, the desert and the old maid is a very small location, but its reality is the old maid is everything, all encompassing, and the desert is only uh, a result of the old maid because God wills there should be a desert. That's the Rechaim HaKodesh. You know, the... Um, it's a beautiful word from Chavetz Chaim. We find that David, Hamelech, the author of Tilim, when he speaks about Torah, he says, "Tovli Torah spicha me alfei zov That the words of Torah are so special; they have greater value than alfei zov thousands of talents of gold and silver. His son Shlomo Melch initially in Proverbs writes. Yikorim pininim. It's more precious than pininim. One interpretation pininim means diamonds. From the word pininim, because when a diamond merchant carries diamonds, he carries it on his person. Yikorim pininim. Torah is more precious than diamonds. So the Chavetz Chaim asks, what is Shlom Melch? What aspect, what characteristic is Shlom Melch adding to what his father said? His father said, it has great, it's more valuable than Alfa Yizov Chesef. Thousands of pieces of gold and silver. He says, no, it's more valuable than diamonds. So Chaim explains that if you have one ounce of gold, if you have 10,000 ounces of gold, it's the same, it's just multiples of that same value. An ounce is a thousand dollars, you have so many more ounces, it's multiples of that. When we speak about a diamond, a diamond is one carat diamond, a certain quality, the flawless. And you have a 10, Carrot diamond is flawless. Is it 10 times the value of one? Or it's beyond that, it's a different dimension of diamond. It's not 10 times the one. It's a different dimension of diamond. As he explains, a person studies one mesechta, one tractate. He say, what is his value as being spiritualized as a Talmud Chochem? He's a one tractate Talmud Chochem. So let's see in those three tractates. He's three, the one, three times the one. He has three times as much knowledge. But it, so on that, he says, no. A person who studies more Torah, he's a different dimensional person. It's not we're adding one, two, three, but rather just as the diamond, it's another dimensional diamond. As it gets larger, as one advances himself in Torah, the Torah brings him to another level dimension of person as he advances in Torah. That's the Chavetz Chaim, what he says, this is the feature and the characteristic which Shlomo is adding to what his father had said. So I'd ask the question, Shlomo says, Yikori bipninim. Torah is even more valuable than diamonds. But if this is the reality of diamonds, what does it mean Torah is more valuable than diamonds? The difference between diamonds and Torah is, why did diamonds, regardless of their clarity and their size, why are they so valuable? Because there's a market, people are interested in buying diamonds. If nobody would be interested in buying diamonds, it's irrelevant how large your diamond is or the clarity of that diamond. It's all based, it's all market-driven. Torah in its own right has that innate value regardless of what people value. Because since Torah itself is, is what is, is, is the basis for all existence, it's the blueprint for existence, and it generates all the energies for existence, and it's Chochmas Hashem innately, 
it has that infinite precious value. Diamonds, that may be the reality of the way it's evaluated. However, in terms of its innate value, it's only, it's not, it doesn't have innate value. It's only because mankind values that, therefore it's market-driven. Therefore it's your meaning. That's the understanding. So we speak with the old Moed. The Midbar Sinai is vast. Old Moed is a two-by-nothing location compared to the Midbar, to the Midbar Sinai. But in terms of its innateness, it's meaningless. Because this is the location of the Shechina. So I'm going from the specific to the broader, to the all-encompassing. So I'm going from the specific, the first day of the second month, of the second year, which is larger than what? Than the day of the month. That's the Orachim HaKodesh. Just to bring out the point, what, 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 is he, what he's saying. The Gemara tells us that every day there's a Basco, heavenly voice that comes out from Chorei, from Sinai, that announces to the world, Kolom Kulonizu Mishvil Chanin the whole world is sustained in the merit of Rav Chanin Mendoza. The whole world, who's Rav Chanin Mendoza? Shedai lo v'kav charu b'neir Shabbos at Erev Shabbos. That he has, sustenance-wise, subsistence-wise, he only has, his level of poverty is, he only has a kav charu a measure of carob, which sustains him from Erev Shabbos to Erev Shabbos. Shedai lo. And the whole world is sustained in his merit. If you would look at Rav Hanin Dosa, what did he look like? A simple Jew, maybe a holy Jew, who has does not have two nickels to rub together, literally. But the whole world is sustained. All the sustenance of the world comes in his merit. You know, Mo, Warren Buffett, this one, that one, they have mega dollars, mega materials. You know where that mega material exists? In the mirror of this little Jew. Literally, this little Jew, Shaddai Lov Kav So you have small, tiny. What's the innate value of that person? The innate value of that person is worth more than the whole world itself. That in his merit, everybody has bracha. Without him, there's no bracha in the world. Without Shechina, there's no existence. Regardless how vast existence may be. But the old Moed is the basis for all existence. There's a beautiful Moshe, Chavetz Chaim, he, when it comes to giving allegories, bring out points. You know, there's a posuk, the Navi says, Im lobrisi If the Torah would not be in effect continuously, day and night, the world couldn't exist. And the Rav Chaim Voloshna, famous word from Chaim Voloshna, that if there be a moment in time when the Torah would not be studied anywhere in the world, the Torah would revert back to pre-existence. It's so famous from Chaim Velosh. That's why in Valoshin, they always had three shifts of students studying, 10 students studying 24 hours a day. There was always in Valoshin, always 10 students studying Torah. There was never a lapse of Torah in Valoshin because of Chaim Velosh writes in the Nefshech Chaim. However, the Chovetz Chaim cites a Zohar, it's explicit Zohar, but Zohar says that if there should ever be a lapse of what, of Torah for a moment, based on this verse, in Lovisi Yom Veloy, if not my covenant, which is speaking about the Torah, Yom Veloy will continuously, in effect, day and night, Chuks my words will something the world not exist. So he says, what is the Moshe Nadova Dome? What is it analogous to? There was this king, he commissioned a steamboat that he wanted his, a replica of his palace to be built on a steamboat. And that when he goes on the ocean or he travels on the water, he should feel he's always like the equivalent of his palace. And he was wanted just to like glide over the water when he's in his palace, look out the window, see the ocean, see whatever it is, or the river. So finally, the day comes, the steamboat, it's all built and outfitted like the palace. The king walks in, he's like amazed. Every room is replicated. Smaller version, it's the palace with the same amenities, the same furnishings, every identical. He's amazed. And now the sea captain gives him, leaves the dock and they glide over the water. This king is like, he's a level of, Euphoria and joy that he's never experienced. So the king says to the captain, 
could you show me exactly how exactly I see the paddles moving and the water and the ship is gliding over the water, but what's generating the power? What's generating the power? So the so the captain starts explaining to them, the valve of the ship, the furnaces and this coal, and men are completely continuously feeding the coal into the ovens that generates the that the, the the steam and that turns the turbines and that causes the paddles to turn. So the king says to the captain, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see the whole operation. So the captain says to the king, it's not appropriate. There's so much coal dust on the walls and it's so unclean. I don't think it's appropriate for the king to go down there. The king says, no, I insist. I want to see exactly what it is. He says the temperature is, is you, 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 you get roasted by the temperature. The men work down there. They're literally stripped to their skin and they're shoveling in the, the fuel into the, into, the, uh, into the furnaces down there. I want to see it goes down and he sees these people. They don't look like white men. Their bodies are covered with coal dust. The walls are covered with coal dust. It's so unclean because of what's going on down there. And the king sees this. He becomes infuriated. He says, in my palace, this would be such uncleanliness. I will not tolerate it. I want the walls of the ship that with this unclean, I want the walls to be broken out. In his fury, he says this to the king, in his rage. So the captain pleads with him. He says, if we break out the walls, the ship goes down. It doesn't make a difference. I will not tolerate this level of uncleanliness. It's inappropriate. They break out the walls, the ship goes down. With the king and everything. So the Chavetz Chaim says, you walk into a base medrash and you see a Jew. He looks malnourished. He's wearing thread bed clothing. He has, doesn't have two nickels to rub together. And he's sitting, he's dedicated to Torah study. And this rich person, this man of means, sees this little Jew and he looks at him and says, what's his worth? You know, what does he earn? What is he, what is he all about? He doesn't understand that this, this man over here is keeping the ship afloat. That's the Chavetz Chaim. But he doesn't display that special aura that special, whatever it is, status. You know, he does, he's not a caught carrying member of the, you know, of the country cloak. He doesn't drive that car. He doesn't have this. It's probably what he has. The question is, what's his innate value? His innate value is the world exists because of him. He generates, he's generating the turbines. He's filling the coffers. And as a result of that, that's where the brach exists. That's the Chavetz Chaim. We find that Yosef, he was sold as a slave to the house of Potiphar. And before he came to Potiphar, although he was a minister, he didn't have that degree of wealth. When Yosef came to his home, all of a sudden, things started to boom. Materially, he became a very wealthy man. We find that Lovon, before Yaakov came to Lovon, he had no sons. He did not have wealth. After he'd worked the 14 years for his two wives, he says to his father, I'm ready to go back. So Lovin pleaded with him. He says, I'm willing to pay any wage because I've divined that I see that all my brocha has come because of you. So whatever deal you want to cut, we'll cut the deal. I'll give you anything you want. The officer says, I don't want anything. This is what I want, but I don't want you to give me anything. But Lovin recognized that all the brocha that came to his home, materially speaking, was only Begalal Yaakov, only because of Yaakov. The same idea. The Shekhinah is there. The vastness of the desert. We begin Midbar Sinai, Ol Moed. Where does it all emanate from? It emanates from the Ol Moed. That's where it begins and that's where it ends. Mars is in Tainus that before Hashem brings tragedy on the world, he takes, away, he takes the Tzadikim. Why? So there are two interpretations why he takes the Tzadikim. Either because he doesn't want them to pray to avert the tragedy that God wants to bring on the world because that tefillah would not allow it to happen or because he doesn't want them to be exposed to the tragedy because they'll be pained by it. So he first takes them, then he brings the tragedy on the world. One, one or two interpretations. Either because they'll pray, they'll be mispalil, which will not allow it to happen. Hashem says he wants it to happen. So therefore he takes the tzaddikim first or because he doesn't want them to witness the tragedy because it'll cause them that pain. 
Therefore, he takes them first. It was, it's a known fact, World War II, there were three, three leading Torah sages passed away in one month. Who are they? Rav Chaim Rosinski, who was the leading Torah sage in the world. Rav Shimon Shkop, who was the Rashiv of Grodno, who mentored the greatest students in Europe. And Rav Baruch Be'er Leibowitz, who was the commandant of Rosh Hashiva. They all passed away Elul 1942. And there's a picture that the Nazis, Yemach Shmam Vizichram, coming into Vilna in the middle of Chaim Oz's uh, funeral. As the carrying is coughing through the streets, you can see the Nazis coming in with their mechanized, with their, you know, their trucks and whatever it is. Same time. Hashem took three of the leading t- tzaddikim, Talmud in one month, and then that was over. Lithuania fell. Everything, everything fell apart. Same idea. Three, the three Jews. Why? These three Jews are not ordinary Jews. They're not ordinary people. They create an, a, a, a protection, a barrier, a shield. that, that it doesn't allow anything to penetrate that shield. You remove the shield, God forbid, then you're not protected. You're vulnerable to every, every, every onslaught. That's what happened. That is the question. Um. How can we understand that when a tzaddik passes away, that has a that it mechaper, so that should don't you should bring something positive? Not you remove him, so you should be able to bring the chat tragedy. Okay, good. Okay. There's no Rechaim HaKodesh which writes, I was going to ask you to show you, we have the Asur Hirugi Malchus, the Ten Martyrs. They were the greatest group of Torah sages in one generation that since Sinai, there were not such ten people in one generation. The Ten Martyrs, Rebbe Kiva was the greatest of them. And they were, the way they were butchered, the way they were tortured to death. But what? It didn't stop the Romans. That was the most severe moment of that, of the, after the destruction of Besamikdash. That's what happened. And things didn't get better. But the Rechaim Akasha writes that because of what happened to them, till the end of time, we are beneficiaries that whenever the Midas Adin comes out against Klal Yisrael, that tempers the Midas Adin. Because what happened to them then, we today are beneficiaries of what happened then. What happened then had to happen because the only way you could reset the balance, the tragedy has to happen. Satan is not satisfied. I mentioned the Ramchal writes, what is Midas Adin? When Hashem allows Satan to prosecute the record. When the record is audited, that's Midas Adin. Even when you take Tzadikim, things can be so off balance that Tzadik, one Tzadik could be the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of people. Still not enough to regain the, that equilibrium, equilibrium to regain the balance. You need more than that. But after everything's said and done, the value of that versus the future, there's a, it's a different future as a result of that. They point out, you know, during the 18th century, there was a person, he was a Tartar, his name was Chalnitsky, Yemach Shmo Vizichro. He destroyed most of the communities in Eastern Europe. He was the equivalent of Hitler, Chalmnitsky. And it was the 1600s, beginning 1700s. The Shach actually fled for his life. The Shach is the main commentator on Choshen Nishpat. And most of his, many, although we have the Shach is the main commentary on Shulchan Aruch, but m- much of his novelty of Torah were destroyed. And his community was destroyed. After that, after that purging of Jews, do you know what the next generation, what happened? The Vilna Gaon was born. Rebbe Kivega was born. The Chassam Sofa was born. The Ktsos Achosha was born. The Nitzib Samishpat. All the Torah sages that we are beneficiaries today from of the later authorities were born right after that purge, purging. 
it generated such a level of rachnim that Hashem gave forth. Sutton doesn't realize what's coming down the pike. You take the best. We're gonna. I'm gonna replace it with something which is magnificent to right the ship and advance it till the end of time. And they did. These people that were born, the luminaries that were born in the, the end of the 17th century, in the 18th century, till today were beneficiaries of what they were. The Vilna Gold surpassed even people who lived hundreds of years before him. That's how outstanding he was. From Reb Kiveg, to from the Vilna Gold till Reb Kiveg, it was no one as great as Reb Kiveg. These are the people. Again, because the, the record was right to such a degree, it's like, you know, we speak about forestation. Sometimes when you have a forest fire, it regenerates the growth of the forest. Now the forest even grows better. Every once in a while you have to have forest fire. Everything is destroyed and everything is regenerated, is rejuvenated. Same thing in the Rukhni. The physical is always a mirror image of what goes on in the spiritual. Same idea. There's a story, you know, the Miri Yeshiva went to Kobe, Japan, and went to Shanghai during the war. And in me, in Europe, in Shanghai, on that uh, Trans-Siberian Express, that train, it wasn't only mere students. There were certain students from other yeshivas. The best of those yeshivas were on that transport, on that train, went to Vladivostok, went to Kobe, and ultimately were in Shanghai during the war. There were certain people who received visas to come to the United States. There were two brothers. Rav Aaron Kotler had a kolel in White Plains, New York, during World War II. When he came to the States, besides being involved in Varad Solo, he had a kolel in White Plains. And these two students of the Mir Yeshiva, who had re- they were from Germany, they were learning in the Mir, they had visas from relatives in the United States. They were able to secure visas that they were able to leave Kobe and come to the United States rather than going to Shanghai. Reb Chatzka Levenstein, who was the Mir Mashgiach, who was a man who was divinely inspired, says to them, I advise you to come with us. Don't use the visas and go to the United States. Because the level of learning, the Siat and Deshmai, we're going to merit in Shanghai. You can be able to advance yourself multiples that what you can have regardless of where you learn. And it was a known fact that the level of growth, spiritual growth in Shanghai, in this little cocoon, they learned with literally the, the physical situation was terrible. They barely had what to eat. But the level of literally dedication, sacrifice to Torah was unbelievable. They live like a different realm of existence in Shanghai. They advanced to a level not to be multiples of what they would have had in, back near Poland. And the Torah throughout the world, the Roshivas and Panovich, the Roshivas all over, mo- the majority of them were, were actually were Mira students. They were students of the Briskarov, because many of the students of the Miri Shiva, they went and they studied on the Briskarov and came back. And they were students of Rabbi Yeruchim Levovitz, besides Rabbi Yeruchim. So t- the core of Torah today, it's all what happened in, in, because of the mirror. So that's reforestation. Europe was destroyed, but there was an explosion. After the war, these people went to Israel and they came to the United States. It was replanted. And in the 50s, we didn't see it. In the 60s, we began seeing it. Once the 70s came, things started to explode. It was a new reality. In the world, there was a new level of, of representation of Torah, which existed. I'm not saying qualitatively it was that, but in terms of quantitative, for sure, in qualitative, it was a semblance of what was. The book of Ayukra is called Sefer HaPikudim. It's the book of numbers. The Jews have been counted. I were counted from the age of 20 and above. That's the age of conscription. It's always Yotzi Latsovo. And the Jews accounted. And we find that the Levim 
were counted at a different age than when the ordinary Jew was counted. All the tribes were counted with the Machsa Shekel from the age of what? The age of 20 and above. The Levim were counted from the age of 30 days. They were counted. Now, and they were counted separately. And that's what this, that's what the Parsha is about. It's the counting of the Jews. And why did he count them? Rashi, because of the love, the special love Hashem has for us, he counts us continuously. How many Jews left Egypt? We were counted. Only 20% left. After there was the plague, the ones who were killed, how many casualties, how many people died because of the Chet Egel? They counted again. Later, Minyan Asorim. The Mishkan was erected and took on a permanent status in Nisan. And he counted them a month later. After they were, he was secure in their midst and they had appreciation, he counted them. It's new level of relationship. Suez Rosh Bene Koladas Bene Yisrael Mishkos Bene Sabosam. You should count the heads of the families of the congregation of Yisrael based on families on the paternal line. The identity of Jews is based on the paternal. I'm not saying the Jewishness, but in terms of pedigree of to what tribe you belong, it's based on who your father was. The Mispar, Shemus Kozachul Wosam, the number of names, all males, based on their the head count. Rashi. The Mishkosam Da Min Koshevit Vishavit. First, we want to know each tribe. How many people were in each tribe? Based on Vosam, Mi Ovid Mishavit Echod, the Imo Mishavit Acher. On the paternal side, you're from one tribe, your mother from the other tribe, Yoko Moshevit Oviv. He identifies with the paternal side, right? You're a Kohen, not because your mother was a Kohen, Bats Kohen, but because your father was a Kohen. You, you, you're from the Shevet Yehuda, because from the paternal side, you watch, you're from Yehuda, not from the maternal side, okay? Gugulosam, Al Yedei, Shkolim, Bekel Gugolos. How will we count it? Bekel Gugolos. That's the Machsa Shekel. From the age of 20 and above, whoever is eligible for conscription, they should be counted. The Tzavosim, according to the numbers, Atavaron. And you and Aaron should be the ones to count them. And together with you, Itchem you, Ish Ish Lamate, Ish Rosh Lebe As the counted, each person, each Nasi should be there while the tribe is being counted. Rashi says, Itchem you, Chetiftu Osom, you imochem, Nasi kol Shevet v'Shevet. Together with you and Aaron, he should be the Nasi, the prince of that Shevet. So over here, there's an interesting Balaturim. We find that when we were counted after the Chet Egel, Aaron was not there for that counting. This counting now, Aaron's involved in this counting. So he explains, if you have the if you have a Mikroskonos Komish, he says, Mal Parshis Kisisa lo si Aaron bosa minyon, Vishal Yodo Nasa Egel, Shivishvilo Hutzkul the minyon. Because Aaron participated in the Chet Egel, as a result of that, he was not part of that county because it's due to his participation. We had the casualties. Therefore, there he was not, he was not part of that, the process of counting. But here, this counting is unrelated. It's the Shechina. Therefore, he's part of the counting. Second.
So over here, this is a lengthy Ramban. The Ramban tries to explain David HaMelech. He made a mistake. And he counted the Jews. And because he counted the Jews, there was a plague. And his general pleaded with him and said to him, you realize you're not supposed to count Jews. And if you count Jews, you could have a magefa, you could have a plague. David nevertheless counted them. Why? What was David's mistake? And the Ramban says something that a, an elementary school child knows that Jews should, uh, should not be counted. Why did he count them? Why was there a plague? He means he didn't use a machzah shekel. He used the machzah shekel. So Ramban explains that even when you count Jews through a median, even a machzah shekel, that's only if the counting is for value. What's value? The only time you count Jews is for conscription. You're going to war. Since there's a concept in Sobchel on this, we don't rely on miracles. So therefore, we have to know how many people do we have in our standing army? We count them. So therefore, Jews themselves, you, why are you counting them? It's within the objective for a purpose. But let's say you're not, you're not going to war. And there's no reason. Just to count for whatever, whatever other reason, you're not permitted to count them. Why? So he quotes a posu, because Hashem said, when he gave the bracha to Avram, he said, Lo mirov. They should not be counted mirov because of their numerous number. So simply lo suffering rov means will be so many, we're not computable. So if that's the case, if we're not computable, we can't be counted. Just, just factually, it's not, you can't come upon the number. So the suffering rov does mean you can't count them in, the, in, in, in number-wise, quantity. You could count them. Factually, you could come upon the number. So what did, what did Hashem say? They should not be counted because of their abundance. And therefore, Hashem only allowed us to be counted if we're going to war. We need a standing army. But for any other reason, you're not permitted to count Jews. So the Ramban explains that David wanted to know, firstly, when you count, you only count one of the approaches is from the age of 20 and above. He accounted from the age of 13 and above, from Bar Mitzvah, which is not permitted. That's the first. Second thing he said, no, he wanted to know how many people were in his kingdom. How many subjects did he have? God says, that's not why you count Jews. Because whether you have 10 subjects, you have a thousand subjects, a million subjects. What is the innate value of Klal Yisrael? That were the Amashem. That's our value. We just finished reading in the Chukosai. If you go and you follow my statutes and you toil in Torah, sacrifice for God, one Jew will pursue a thousand. So number plays no role. So what is the value of a Jew? The value of a Jew is his innate relation with God. Because of his relationship, therefore he has innate value, which is not computable. You can't. So the moment you try to evaluate it number-wise, you're distorting the reality of what, what we are. What we are is not based on our number. What we, what we are is based on who we are. And well, who we are... That's something which is not understandable. It's not fathomable. And that's the meaning of the Yusuf and Mirov. You're not permitted to count them because of abundance, because of the, their innate, unlimited value. That's why they can't be counted. When you go to war, we have to be down to earth. We need a standing army. Ain't so much on this. So we have to know how many able-bodied men do we have to go to war. But outside of that, there's no reason to count. And that was David's mistake. He counted with the medium. But because it was not for that specific objective to go to war, that was the failing. So what was the lesson taught? The lesson he taught was, you think you want to know how many you have, not only will it not establish the number, that will cause the number to dwindle, to, to dwindle and that was the cause of the plague. That's how the Ramban explains it. But again, it, but it's all based on the concept of what, of the innateness of who Klaus is. It's a quantitative value, it's not a quantitative value, quantitative value. So you're saying the, the counting now, at least 